Good evening, everybody uh, from Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. I'm glad to say that the rain has stopped um, because it's been pretty wet um, over here. However, the birds that you see on the cover slide there, uh, the kittiwakes, uh, they spend uh, most of their winter, as do the likes of puffins, at sea. And so they're very much welcoming the, the, the water. Uh, they only actually come uh, onto land uh, to breed. And Scotland actually is one of the main um, breeding uh, colony, uh, breeding locations for these particular uh, species. And if ever you're looking for a good day out, then uh, Fowls Huch near Stonehaven, just 15 miles south of Aberdeen, um, is a really nice place to visit. And you'll see lots of kittiwakes, razorbills, um, foamers, and indeed, if you walk to right to the end of the path, you'll see some puffins. And so it's a really good day out. One thing I would watch is that it does go right to the edge of 90 foot cliffs. So if you're at all a wee bit worried about um, sort of uh, falling over the cliff because you get a wee bit scared of heights, then don't go to the edge. Um, and with me, when I'm, I take a lot of pictures and with my camera, I'm sort of looking over the edge and sometimes I forget. <laughs> I sort of nearly go tumbling over. Anyway, um, it's really nice to be here um, and to have this opportunity to speak to um, a group. Unfortunately, I, I, I can only see a few of you, um, but to speak to a group about uh, marine and marine systems. And the title of my talk from nano to macro, shallow to 10,984 meters, vast and essential for life on air. Um, normally, if we were all in the room together, I'd get you to ask what 10,984 meters refers to, but as we're not, I'll just tell you. It's actually the deepest part of the ocean, 10,984 meters. And what that means is you can actually put the whole of Mount Everest into the ocean at that point and still have two kilometers of water above it. So actually that gives you an idea of how big the ocean is. Now, probably when you were at school, you were made to learn how many oceans there are, the Arctic Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Well, actually, there is only one ocean. And the point is that we have one mass of water. Now, in the middle of this slide here is the Earth, but we're looking at it um, from underneath, if you like, in terms of looking up at the South Pole. We're looking up at Antarctica, which is the white blob in the middle of the picture. But when you look at the Earth from this angle, what you see is that there is only one ocean. There are a variety of basins uh, within e uh, the, the ocean, but there is one big interconnected ocean. In fact, it's an ocean with a volume of 1.33 billion cubic kilometers. So just work that out into cubic millimeters. <laughs> see how, see how, what size of uh, figures you get. But to give you an idea of how vast the ocean actually is, each cubic decimeter of seawater contains on average about 13 billionths of a gram of gold. So cubic decimeter, 13 billionths of a gram of gold. But if you were able to extract all the gold from the ocean, then actually it's equivalent to having the same amount of gold as in 4,365 Fort Knoxes. In other words, you could have 20 Fort Knoxes in each country in the world filled with gold. Now, I haven't quite found out how to extract gold from seawater yet that when I do, I won't be telling anybody. <laughs> I will have to extract quite a lot to get a reasonable amount, but I don't need that much. But that gives you an idea of the size of the ocean. And in terms of the ocean economy, it is worth 
um, about $1.5 trillion. And as I say, in terms of the depth, the deepest part of the ocean is uh, nearly 11 kilometers deep. It's in the Pacific and the, the Mariana Trench. And I don't need to tell um, uh, a group of people like yourselves about the effects of water and pressure. And yet down at those depths, animals live. And in fact, although the bulk of the marine environment is at a, pre is at a temperature of round about um, three degrees up to about 20, 25 degrees, there's an area in the ocean where the water temperature is 400 degrees centigrade. And of course, the water doesn't boil because of the pressure there. And the key thing is that there's a whole ecosystem of life lives around that and within that hot water. So what you suddenly see is that this marine system is an absolutely phenomenal system in terms of the types of ecosystems that exist, in terms of the biodiversity, in terms of the fact that it has life in the ocean that doesn't exist on land. And you know, we, we, we've got things like um, zombie worms living uh, in, in, in the deep ocean. And we've got a lot of animals yet that we actually really don't know about. So we've got one ocean that's interconnected. The other thing is the ocean that we have, we're in an absolutely critical location. This uh, map on the, um, the left of the screen here is obviously the Atlantic. Um, and what you see is uh, the, this orange thing, which there is called the Gulf Stream. And what happens is that the Gulf Stream moves across the Atlantic. And by the way, before it gets to us, it's no longer called the Gulf Stream. It's called the North Atlantic Current. In fact, we call the whole of the circulation the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So next time, if you have a Christmas pub quiz, ask why the UK is warmer than it is, and everybody will go Gulf Stream. You'll go, no, terribly sorry. It's the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So play your, play your joker on that one. Um, but the key thing is that what happens is that this movement of water from about 30 degrees north in terms of latitude moves something in the region of 1.3 petawatts of heat. That's a lot of heat, 10 to the 15 watts of heat. And it carries this heat northwards. And what happens is that as it moves north, there's a transference of the heat from the water to the atmosphere. And we lose about 0.8 um, petawatts to the atmosphere. So by the time you've got to where we are in Aberdeen, 57 degrees north, there's a massive amount of heat gone into the atmosphere. And what that actually means is Scotland, and indeed the rest of the west of Europe, is warmer than it might be for its latitude. And the example I've given there is a comparison of John O'Groats, which is the J in um, red against Churchill in Canada. They're the same latitude. Now I know that one's a bit more landlocked than the other and there are some variations, but actually look at the temperatures, the winter temperatures, and look at the difference between John O'Groats and Churchill. And this is partly due to the fact of this movement of heat in water because of the heat capacity of water uh, northwards. This goes through what's called the Faro Shetland Channel and you'll see a purple circle on the uh, diagram there. And there's some purple dots which actually go from Faro across to Shetland. And these two are, represent uh, transects which the Marine Laboratory in Aberdeen have been investigating since 1893. So they cover um, three centuries and two millennia. I think that's fantastic to be able to say that. 
but they cover that. And we've been investigating that particular area. And why is it so important? Because it is one of the main routes north of the AMOC. And it takes energy north, but once it gets to a certain latitude in the north, it's cooled down. And also, it's very simple physics in terms of salty water density and all the rest of it and heat. And it sinks and it comes back out of the Arctic and moves south as deep cold water. And that is one of the main global pumps that actually pumps that one ocean and the one lot of water around the ocean. So by pure coincidence, Scotland is in a very specific and very unique place for monitoring the global circulation. And what we are worried about is that as the water um, in the Arctic, as the ice on Greenland melts, the water freshens. And as the water freshens, it changes the salinity. And as the salinity changes, density changes. And there's a real risk that actually the pump will slow up. And if the pump slows up, the northward movement of heat decreases. And actually, we could reach a situation, depending on what happens with climate, where Scotland becomes like Churchill. And we will have these very, very cold winters. And actually, what that shows is that life in Scotland is totally dependent on the ocean. Your life in Scotland is totally dependent on the ocean because the ocean is dictating the seasons, it's dictating our weather patterns, it's actually dictating life in Scotland. And that's why I believe the ocean is so important. Oh, let's see why you're not moving on. There we go. So let's just have a quick look at what marine life is. This is where I get really excited because marine life is just phenomenal. Um, it goes from 100 nanometers. Um, and the example on the left of the this, of this screen is a non-tailed virus. So um, we all know about viruses because of what's happened uh, over the last year. But actually, there are many, 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 many viruses in the marine environment. And this is a particular one. So we go from 100 nanometers through Emilianii huxleyi, which is known as a coccolithophore, and that's actually a plant. And it's, it's, it's a phytoplankton. And the key things about it, I think these are wonderful. You see the patterns on the, what the individual plates. And each of the plates is called a coccolith, and they're made from carbonate, um, uh, 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 well, sorry, in carbonate chemistry. And these are what make up the White Cliffs of Dover. White Cliffs of Dover is made up of all these little plates joined together over a period of time. And each plate is only about two micrometers. But that's where, why the White Cliffs of Dover are white, because of Emilianii Huxleyi. And then we go through the, 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 the sort of the gelatinous uh, Lucatiara octona, uh, which is a, a, a zooplankton. And I think it actually looks like the inside of the TARDIS for those of you who are into Doctor Who, uh, because you see it's got the bit that pumps. But you can see the red bit in the middle, that's its insides. Um, it's, it grows up to about 50 millimeters uh, in size. So we've gone from nanometers to micrometers to millimeters. And then uh, over on the right of the screen, there's a herring. I hope you all like a nice piece of herring. Um, that's about 46 centimeters that they grow to. Um, we've got the herring gull. We're now into the meters. It's got a wingspan of, of 1.4 meters. The gray seal, um, the, uh, the adult male, grows to about three meters in size. And then we go to the blue whale. Now, in this case, I'd have to say this is the only uh, creature in, in, in this sort of uh, montage that is not a very common visitor to Scotland. It does visit Scotland, but not very often. This particular one, 
um, I was having a competition with my son to see who could take the best photo of it. Um, he won, uh, which was a bit of a shame. But um, so this is his photograph, not mine. But um, this is a, a blue whale that we saw off the north of Iceland. And to actually see 30 foot, uh, sorry, 30 meters of blue whale close up is gobsmacking. And when you think about the fact that that animal has a heart the size of a mini car, and you kind of think, wow. And the, the rate at which, and the volume of blood, it pumps, the heart pumps about 264 liters of blood per second. So think about these numbers, they're quite mind boggling. But we've gone from petawatts of heat to nanometers in size, to a heart the size of a mini car, and animals living in temperatures around about, 20, uh, around about 10 degrees, to animals living in temperatures of 400 degrees, and we're only three slides into the top. That's pretty impressive, I think, in terms of marine systems. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm so impressed by them. Now, if we go down to the flame shell, this, this four centimeter little creature, these flame shells are just the vibrancy of their colors. You don't need to go abroad to see these. You do need to go under the water in Scotland, so you're gonna get cold. But what you see here is this flame shell. Now, off the west coast of Scotland, about a kilometer off our coast, on the west coast of Scotland, is a flame shell bed that contains 250 million flame shells and we only discovered it three years ago. We didn't know it existed until three years ago. And it's only about a kilometer off our shore. This again gives you an indication of the fact that we don't know too much about our marine environment and we actually need to know a bit more. Most of you probably have eaten some nephrops. Yeah, also known as Lo no Norway lobster or langoustine, very, very tasty. I've had some of those where um, they've been fished up onto the deck and sort of in the pan with the, within about 10 minutes. <laughs> very, very fresh and they're very, very nice. Um, and dead man's fingers, an example of the corals that we have off Scotland. When we tell people actually, there are lots of different cold water corals off Scotland. They say you get corals off Scotland. Yes, we really do. We have got corals off Scotland. Corals and Emilianii have got a carbonate base. One of the challenges we're seeing is the pH this is of, of our sea is beginning to decrease and that will have consequences, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So this is Scotland Seas. This is the area that I'm responsible for. And the uh, EEZ, which is the darker blue splodge in the middle, is approximately 462,263 square kilometers in area. In other words, it's six times the land mass of Scotland, which is quite good, actually. It's, and also, we go down to about two, 3,000 meters which is of course deeper than the highest mountain in Scotland. And we've got an additional 156,481 square kilometers of seabed and subsoil um, further off to the west coast, that's known as Hatton. And so that's actually the area we've got, you know, over um, 600,000 square kilometers of seabed to look after. So that's a lot of seabed. And one of the things we've got to be aware of is the benefits that we get from the sea. And this is another reason why I think it's so important that we understand about the sea. For example, the sea, the marine environment, provides us with 50% of the oxygen we breathe. And we all know about the Amazon and the Amazon forests and the fact they provide a mass amount of oxygen. But actually, here's an example that not many people know about, but actually the amount of oxygen that uh, the marine environment produces is equivalent to um, basically the same amount as is produced 
um, by plants on land. The other thing is that there's an increasing marine biotechnology industry developing because citarabine and erbiulin mesylate are both anti-cancer agents from marine sponges. And there's also a, a, a drug called uh, zeconitide, which comes from the cone snail, which is a very, very potent painkiller, especially for chronic long-term pain. Now, these drugs, these chemicals are extremely complex in nature. Nature doesn't waste energy. So why is it that sponges are making these chemicals? Why is it that the cone snail is making a chemical that um, is a potent painkiller? Now, we don't have the answers to many of these questions, but what we do know is that there are many, many more um, um, animals out there and plants out there which could well um, yield not only anti-cancer drugs, um, but uh, antiviral drugs and uh, analgesics. And so there's a criticality there around what marine can give us. But not only that, we're all aware of greenhouse gases, of carbon dioxide emission. And of course, one of the challenges with Scottish government that I have is that 50% of all Scottish government emissions come from our five ships. So <laughs> it's, it's of, of everything else, um, is 50% is and our five ships represent 50% of the total emissions from Scottish government. Now, one of the things about CO2 uh, is that it gets dissolved into the seawater. And as I say, it produces carbonic acid uh, and that has a uh, problematic, but approximately a quarter of all the additional CO2 that has been produced as a result of anthropogenic activity has been absorbed by the sea. And so the sea is actually buffering us against the impact and effects of climate change. But not only that, the sea gives us fish and shellfish to eat. It gives us energy. So renewable energy is um, certainly coming up the agenda in terms of wind turbines, in terms of tidal turbines. We're looking at harvesting seaweed. We're looking at the genetic resource that might be in there. But also, culturally, I, I was down at Aberdeen uh, Beach the other day, and the number of people just out having a walk was incredible. And it's actually been shown that people living near the sea have a longer life than people who live away from the sea. And so the health and well-being associated with marine um, is now quite well documented. And of course, it's great to go and watch the wildlife um, and just sit and watch the sun set into the sea or indeed rise out of the sea every morning. I cycle to work and I cycle along a cliff path and I watch the sun rising out of the sea every morning. And it's just phenomenal to see. So the sea is something that gives us stuff, it's provisioning, there's a cultural aspect, it's regulating in terms of buffering us against carbon storage, and it's supporting in terms of the fact that there are habitats and species there, it's involved in the nutrient cycle, the water cycle, the energy cycle. So it's an absolutely fundamental component of life on Earth. However, there are many, 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 many pressures to which the, uh, the ocean is subjected. And just a few of them are there. Again, I come back to carbon dioxide and ocean acidification. But what we're finding is that uh, all the nutrients that have been put on fields are ultimately being washed into the marine environment. And so an excess of nutrients is um, a, a problem in the marine environment. The changes that are coming about because of both climate change and because of human activities are resulting in a loss of biodiversity. Contaminants, we, 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 we as humans are hugely um, ingenious in terms of developing um, poisons and in developing chemicals to 
protect us or to help us or whatever. But what we're not very good at is assessing the impact on non-target species or assessing long-term impact. And so the polychlorinated biphenols that you see, um, the, 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 the hexagon compounds, um, now banned in production, um, and in fact have been banned uh, for at least 20 years. But actually, two years ago, we found a killer whale dead, and it had the highest ever concentration of PCBs detected in any animal. That's despite the fact production is banned, use is banned. And why is this? It's because they're so recalcitrant in the environment that they're just cycling around the environment. What's the impact? Well, we have a killer whale population on the west coast of Scotland, but they haven't had a calf, we think, for about 30 years. And there's a strong chance that this is linked to the high concentration of PCBs uh, in the parent animals. And it's likely that that particular um, uh, 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 population may well go extinct in that area. Also, what we find is we've got this thing called the carpet sea squirt. It looks absolutely yucky. It is an invasive non-native species. And what we're seeing is that um, again, as, 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 as ship's architects, you'll be well aware of, of ballast and ballast water and requirement for ballast water treatment and all the rest of it. But there are still opportunities. There are still vectors for um, various uh, animals and plants to be carried and then released into the seas uh, around about uh, different areas of the world. And as the conditions change, as they become warmer, there's an opportunity for these animals and plants to establish themselves. Sea level rise is occurring more rapidly than for a long, long time. It's occurring for two reasons. One, because the water is heating up. And when water heats, it expands. And secondly, because of the melting of the ice sheets on Greenland. And the sea level rise, and I'll come back to that later, is, is, is becoming a real issue in terms of the rate or uh, is increasing. And so are our coastal defenses sufficient to deal with the current rate in lies in sea levels? Are our harbors um, going to have to adapt to a different sea level? What might we have to do in all our ports and harbors as the sea level changes? And it's compounded by the fact that we have a loss of natural protection. Actually, if we allowed nature to protect um, us a lot of the time, it would possibly do a better job than the structures that we put in place. So uh, nature-based solutions are certainly being looked at more often uh, than they used to be. And of course, in terms of extraction, we've extracted hydrocarbon, uh, so hydrocarbon products uh, from the, the seabed for a long, long time. And of course, that's part of the reason why we've got climate change. So it's a bit circuitous. But of course, now we're looking to extract wind power and wave power and tidal power. So these multiple pressures are a real issue. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples. This one here, this is a fulmer. And one of the problems of the way fulmers feed is that they fly around and um, they, they, they see something in the water, they dive down and they eat it. They don't really think about what they're eating and so they swallow it pretty quickly. And often now it's a bit of plastic and they're not able to regurgitate that plastic and they're not able to pass it out the rear end either. So what actually happens is the plastic becomes lodged inside their tummies and eventually the tummy becomes so full of plastic that they starve to death and die. So what you see here um, in, the, in, the, in the, the picture just underneath uh, Ewan Edwards is the contents of one fulmer's stomach. And unfortunately, it's become a, a way of detecting plastics. So basically, we collect the dead fulmers, open up their tummies, and measure the plastics. And internationally now, this is recognized as a way of assessing um, the amount of plastics in the marine environment. 
and whether or not it is changing. And what you see here is the percent of boomers um, with greater than 0 0.1 grams of plastic in their tummy. And as countries around the North Sea, we've decided that this should not exceed 10%. As you see on these running five-year averages, we're nowhere near that value of 10%. And the Scottish islands, you see there, is running almost straight at around about 50%. Now, some of the anomalies of how people label things, but East England um, is actually the whole East Coast of the UK. <laughs> so that orange line there is the whole East Coast of the UK. Um, sometimes some of our international colleagues um, uh, sort of name things a bit peculiarly. But anyway, that's the, the, the East Coast of the UK. So what you see here is that using um, a, 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 this particular tool, of looking at the plastics in Fulmer's tummies, we see that the, the, the value is almost consistent um, since 2000 to round about the last data point that's on there, uh, which is 2017. So we're away far off the target and, and, and at the moment, there's not a massive indication of a decline. Okay. Now, the other thing is, and this is probably will interest you, uh, this is to do with noise. Now, hopefully I've managed to get this so that you'll actually hear the noises. I did some adjustments to my, my, my system, but this is pile driving, which hopefully you hear. Do you hear it? There we go. That's pile driving at two kilometers. If I put on pile driving at 30 kilometers, it's a very different sound. But that's at 30 kilometers where the pile driver is. And then this is what a ship sounds like underwater. Now, when you're listening to these sounds, I find them quite jarring, quite grating. Now compare it to this sound here, which is dolphins. Now you have to listen quite intently because it's a squeak. quite faint, but hopefully you heard uh, the squeaks there. And I th actually think they're quite, they're quite good. And the last thing I'd like, to, like you to hear is humpback whale songs. Now, for those of you who are Star Trek fans, you may be able to remember that they made a whole Star Trek film around humpback whale songs. Um, but this is what they sound like. Okay, so you've got these dolphins and whales, which make the types of sounds that you heard, and then think about the noises that we are making, the noise, noises from pile driving, the noises from ships. What's the impact of that going to be on the animals who are re reliant on sound for communication, who are reliant on sound for finding their mates? And so one of the things we really got to be thinking about is the environment is not silent in the marine environment, but what we have done is we've added some very, very strange and quite dominant sounds. You just think about that pile driving at 30 kilometers. Um, and when you think about the fact that humpback whale, they're hoping to communicate with animals over longer than that 30 kilometer distance. So we've made it quite a noisy environment um, for it. And uh, on the left here, what we've got is this is how we've picked up these sounds. We've introduced a monitoring array uh, from uh, Latheran in, uh, just in the north of the Murray Firth, uh, right down to St. Abbs. And these are there, they are permanently recording um, sounds, 
um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, we're finding lots of new things. It, we, we, we're hearing um, noises from some whales that we didn't think passed by us very often. Uh, but more importantly, um, the, the, the ones that are um, the, the C pods and SM2M, which are the squares, we can actually listen and we can differentiate the type of dolphin from the clicks and the noises that we're hearing. So we're actually able to do some ecological studies as well as thinking about the um, noises that we're producing. Now, this is one of the plots that actually genuinely causes the hair in the back of my neck to rise up. What this is, is the atmospheric CO2 concentration. And we're going back 800,000 years. So this is an 800,000 year plot. Now, why have I put the pyramids of Giza up? Well, if you look at the brown line very close to zero, that represents the period from when the pyramids were built to today. So that's basically when the Egyptians were around up to today, which gives you an idea of the time scale uh, that we're looking at. The blue double-headed arrow just beside the brown line represents the last ice age. But what you see is that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, and this has been measured from ice cores. So we've measured the concentration of CO2 in bubbles of air caught and trapped in ice cores. And as we go along, um, the peaks are interglacial periods, which is where we are uh, at the moment. And the troughs are ice ages. So we go through a regular cycle of interglacial periods and ice ages, or warm periods and cold periods. And over the last 800,000 years, the concentration has very rarely gone above 280 parts per million. But then you come to sort of a period from about 1780 onwards, and indeed from 1958, when we started measuring it at um, Mauna Loa and Hawaii and doing direct measurements, and you see this is the plot that you get. First thing to notice is there's an annual cycle associated with uh, summer and winter in the Northern Hemisphere because there's more land mass in the North than there is in the South. And so respiration, photosynthesis, uh, results in the annual cycle that you see, maximizes in May, minimizes in October. But what you see is that actually in the last um, 120 years or so, we've gone from about 300 parts per million in 1911 to a concentration above 400 parts per million today. That is an increase of 100 parts per million plus. And 100 parts per million plus is the difference between an ice age and a warm period. And we've already exceeded that in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide that we have produced. What does this actually mean? Well, the record was uh, 10th of February, 2020. Uh, with the value that you see there um, at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And we anticipate actually that despite lockdown, despite the reductions in emissions, that this value will be um, something of a past value by the time we get to May 2021. The value yesterday at Mauna Loa in Hawaii was 413.03 parts per million. And you compare that to a year ago, it was 411.40 parts per million. And what we are seeing actually is about a 2.5 parts per million increase per annum. But if you look at the figure of 316 in 1960 and 369 in 2000, so a 40 year uh, gap, you'll realize that it wasn't a rate of 2.4 parts per million back then. And in fact, the bulk 
of the increase, or at least a significant proportion of the increase, has occurred since 2000. And so this is absolutely why we should be extremely concerned about what's happening. And the effect of this is sea temperatures are going up, ocean acidification is, is occurring, sea level is going up, the overall global surface temperature is going up, and the oceans are deoxygenating. Now, some of the models that have been run have indicated that if we continue going the way we're going, the atmospheric uh, CO2 concentration will reach something in the region of between 500 and 800 parts per million by 2100. Now, if I tell you that the last time the global CO2 concentration was 427 parts per million, water levels were seven, the sea level was 17 meters higher than it currently is. And we're currently round about the 415. We need to start thinking about what's happening sooner rather than later. Because actually, this is not us looking at um, a fairly dire situation in 300 years time. This is us looking at a fairly serious situation in the not too distant future. Now, I mentioned that the seas had absorbed a lot of the carbon dioxide. In fact, they've absorbed about a quarter of the carbon dioxide that's been produced. What this uh, particular slide shows is the derived pH um, at a, a site about uh, three nautical miles off Stonehaven. The top plot is the surface uh, pH. The bottom plot is uh, at depth, about 45 meters. And this is from 2009 to 2013. And if you just eyeball the top panel, what you see is that the purples are towards the top and the greens are towards the bottom. In other words, what we're seeing is a decrease from 2009 to 2013 in the pH in the, ocean, in the seas uh, off the northeast of Scotland. Now, what you'll also see is quite a significant um, annual cycle as well that's associated with the various cycles that occur in the sea, but there is an indication that the pH is decreasing. The pictures are of um, a gastropod larvae, and what you see there is that these are shells, and you see two areas in the shell, one which is normal shell and one which is the result of dissolution. In other words, we are beginning to see shell damage already as a result, we think, of the changing concentration um, of, of um, carbon dioxide in the sea and therefore the effect it's having on the pH of the sea. And overall, globally, we've only seen about a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 pH units drop. And yet we are seeing impacts in the sea. And this is again, not miles away from us. This is the seas of Scotland. So what are we doing about it? In the last sort of um, 10 minutes, what I'd like to do is to now cheer you all up because having depressed you about seeing how bad everything is, um, there is a plan. The key thing is that as humans, we are making use of the marine environment. We are taking things out of the marine environment. And the example here is, is, is wind generation, a new or relatively new um, industry within marine systems. But compare this with the bottlenose dolphin, because we have one of the biggest bottlenose dolphin populations around the UK, just off the northeast coast of Scotland, or the gray seal at Newborough, again, uh, Newbra is just about um, five or six miles north of where um, these, um, these wind turbines are. So to the south of them, we have the bottlenose dolphins. To the north, uh, we have the gray seals. We want to get the balance right in terms of our impact on the marine environment, because every human activity will have an impact. So we want to get that 
impact balanced off against the effect we're having on biodiversity, the effect we're having on whether or not we've got a clean sea, a healthy sea, a biologically diverse sea. So I'm glad to say that at the end of the day, we have a plan. And hopefully we can work through the plan to ensure that future generations have a marine environment that not only delivers services to them, but also is a marine environment that's healthy and biologically diverse. So what's our plan? The first thing about it is having a robust evidence base. Absolutely fundamental. We've got to have a robust evidence base. Part of the challenge is that to have anything in the marine environment in terms of detecting a time trend, we generally need about 15 years of data. So most of our time series have to be at least 15 years long to be able to detect a change. So if we introduce something, a, a measure to combat an activity which is causing a problem, it might take us 15 years to tell you whether or not that measure has been effective. And that actually isn't very helpful when it comes to planning or when it comes to uh, taking things forward because there's not always going to be an immediate answer. But the critters that you see in, this, in the pictures, they're all um, zooplankton. Um, in some cases, the, the um, octopodidae uh, is, is, is a baby octopus. And depending on what it's going to grow into, it can be from five millimeters to 12 centimeters long. Um, but uh, the, the, the animal just above uh, the, 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 the word location is um, uh, the Cleon. And it's actually known as the um, shellless sea butterfly. What is it actually? It's a slug, but it's, I think, a beautiful slug. And what you see here is that all these creatures are more susceptible to many of the changes than the creatures higher up the trophic, um, uh, trophic ladder. What does this mean, though? If they're susceptible and they're no longer there as food, then the animals that eat them aren't going to have anything to eat. If they don't have anything to eat, they starve. So the animals that would eat the next level up, they're not going to have anything. In other words, if we lose a level, everything above it will also suffer. So the seals that are um, hauled out there uh, just uh, north of, of where uh, these, these critters were got from, eventually might find it very difficult to find food. So a robust evidence base is absolutely fundamental. And that is what we are trying to achieve through the marine science that we're undertaking. Whether it's surveying the um, zooplankton using the bongo nets, whether it's taking water samples to look at the salinity, to look at the temperature, because actually the biology is one component, but we also require the supporting parameters of, for example, temperature, and salinity as you have here. The left-hand panel, what you do see is there's a very distinct um, cycle across a year in terms of the temperature. So the temperature minimum um, of, of Aberdeen is uh, round about February. The temperature maximum is actually uh, round about July, August time. But we have this very distinct trend uh, in temperature. So basically, um, those people who go skinny dipping on the 1st of January, they're not actually going when the water's coldest. <laughs> so if you want to go when the water's coldest, go in February, and then you really know what it's like. Um, but what you also see is that there's a cycle in salinity. But you also notice that the error bars um, on these box plots are quite large. And what this shows you is not only the variation, the natural variation, and this was from 1997 to 2013, but actually we are seeing an increasing temperature over time. So that's also partly why uh, we're getting uh, these variations. But when you're looking at the changes in salinity or you're looking at the changes in temperature, you've got to take account of the fact that we have the annual cycle but actually, are we also seeing, in Salinity's case, a freshening um, of the water 
are we seeing in terms of temperature an increase in the temperature? And that supports the biology. Now, one of the things that's important in terms of our plan is to look at specific human activities. And obviously fisheries is a significant human activity. It's a very important human activity for uh, Scotland and indeed for the Northeast of Scotland. What we have here is we have a plot that shows what's happened to uh, the demersal, in other words, the, the fish that are near the seabed, to the cod, to the haddock, um, from about 1980. And what you see, the black dots, and you see the curve, that we have a diminishing demersal population. So what, we, what happened was, in effect, we were outfishing the cod and the haddock from the North Sea. Now the black dashed line that is at about 0.2, that is what we see as the threshold value. And that's based on a survey that was done periodically as far back as 1908. So what actually we just concluded around about 2000 was that we want to get back to that value. Because if we can get back to that value, that looks to be a value that is sustainable. So working very closely with the industry, management action was taken. And what you see here is that we are predicting that in the next two, three, four years, we might well cross the threshold value. In other words, we went from, we've gone from a position of potentially outfishing the cotton haddock in the North Sea to getting it back to where it has sat for approximately 80 or 100 years of scientific measurements. And therefore, we have introduced some management activities. We've worked very closely with the industry and it has been at a cost. This is not free. It's been at a cost to the industry um, that we've actually look as if we may well cross the threshold sometime during this decade. And we continually develop our fisheries management um, because at the moment, the future fisheries management document, um, and this is a quote from it about sharing our aspirations for the state in relation to managing our fisheries, but ultimately we want uh, fishing to be responsible and to be conducted in a sustainable way, um, came out in October of this year. So we're introducing new measures, not only to um, ensure that we cross this line, but once we cross this line, that we maintain that value and we don't allow it to dip again. We've heard a lot about the losses in biodiversity, and indeed, we've got a very particular way of managing marine conservation uh, in Scotland. What we've done is we have looked at the seas, we've decided on the habitats and species that we consider to be absolutely special in particular for the seas around War, uh, Scotland, and we call them priority marine features. And what we do is we look for, and we carry out surveys to find these priority marine features. And when we find these priority marine features, we put in place management systems through protected areas to make sure that these priority marine features are indeed protected. So we have species conservation, and also we have site protection. But in addition to that, we have uh, wider sea policies, which are done on an international basis, specifically around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. OSPAR is the Regional Seas Convention for the Northeast Atlantic, and they put in place uh, various decisions. The, conservation, the Convention for Biological Diversity, we follow through on that. So basically, we've got uh, a number of processes by which we go through to identify species that are of critical importance. And then basically we uh, go out and we seek and we find. And then once we found them, we put in place processes to protect them. And just uh, earlier on this month, uh, we uh, announced, Scottish Government announced the designation of four new inshore marine protected areas and 12 special protection areas. Special protection areas are specific to protecting seabirds. Uh, whereas the new inshore marine areas are actually uh, for the protection of basking shark and whales. But what it means now 
is that the network of protected areas that Scotland has put in place now covers 30%, 37% of Scotland's seas. So that's how we're protecting, so we, I've shown how we're protecting fisheries, this is how we're protecting uh, nature conservation, but we also have an overall and overarching plan. And this plan is, first of all, as I said earlier, a robust evidence base. Um, before Christmas, Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020 will be published. This is my Christmas present to you all. I won't send you a Christmas card. What I will do is I'll send you the link to Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020. It's totally on a, a, a electronic and you can spend the whole of Christmas Day, Boxing Day, Christmas Day holidays, reading about Scotland's marine environment and what we're doing to protect it. So that'll be my Christmas present to you all. But what this will also do is it will inform a review of Scotland's national marine plan. Because Scotland's national marine plan is yet another way that we are trying to reverse the impacts of human activities and manage the impacts of human activities. Remember, we cannot manage the environment. We can only manage the human activities that are impacting on the environment. So we've got this evidence base, which I can assure you is robust. And uh, we, we will use that not only to inform various program of measures, but also to ultimately review Scotland's National Marine Plan. And that is a spatial plan which says what uh, activities we might allow in what areas. Not only that, but we are engaging very much with the United Nations and the Sustainable Development Goals. In Scotland, we have the National Performance Framework, and the National Performance Framework is our way in Scotland of delivering the Sustainable Development Goals for the United Nations. I think we are the only one of the four nations that is as aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals. And as I say, we've got a, a, a way forward. So Google National Performance Framework tonight before you have your tea and you'll find out exactly what we're doing in terms of delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals and there are a number which are directly related to environment. There's a fisheries one and there's a clean seas one, a cleanliness indicator. OSPAR, the Regional Seas Convention for the Northeast Atlantic is developing an environmental, a revised environmental strategy, which is due to go before ministers of the 15 contracting parties, including the United Kingdom uh, next spring. This will outline the type of monitoring we should be done and also our collaboration with other countries around the North Sea and around the Northeast Atlantic. And this will enable us to not only look at our local area, but to look at a much wider area. Climate change, Scotland has produced both mitigation and adaptation plans. And again, having read Scotland's mean assessment over Christmas, between Christmas and New Year, you can read the mitigation and adaptation plan. So there's no shortage of work for you. And then we have got the ocean decade, uh, sorry, the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development 2021 to 2030. This is a global initiative where the science communities from around the globe are getting together because some of the problems, climate change, are not unique to the seas off Scotland. In fact, the seas in the Arctic are changing much more rapidly than the seas around Scotland. And indeed, when we speak about 1.5 degrees uh, as being sort of an upper limit, or maybe even two degrees has been an upper limit, this has already been surpassed in some areas in the Arctic. And it's reckoned that in the not too distant future, there will be a period in the Arctic where there is no ice at all in summer. That's got all sorts of connotations for transport through the Arctic. What sort of ships are you going to be designing that are going to go through an iceless Arctic, but are not going to pollute it? are not going to cause excessive noise because up until very recently, the animals that lived up there have not had a lot of human noise to deal with. Finally, and tonight hopefully is an example of this, we need to get out. We need to tell people about this. 
we need to get people to engage because actually one of the changes that has to occur is we have to change. Each and every one of us has to do something a bit different because we are the ones who are demanding the energy. We are the ones who are demanding the goods. We are the ones who are saying, this is how we want to live our lives. But actually that's having a consequence on the marine environment. And life on Earth is dependent on a resilient and strong ocean. So in conclusion, marine systems are indeed fundamental for life on Earth. Without them, there would be no life on Earth. If we harm the ocean, we harm ourselves and all other aspects of nature that exist on terrestrial environments and exist in marine environments. The thing is, and the, the, the second bullet point is actually a bit of a quote from Sir David Attenborough. Never before have we had such an awareness of what we are doing to our planet. In other words, we are now giving people the evidence that we are actually messing it up a bit. And we are aware. So what we actually have to do is we have to accelerate our actions to ensure that our ocean can continue to support life in the ocean, but also life in air as we currently know it. Unless we actually galvanize ourselves into action, we will be in a very, very serious position in not too many years time. So, ladies and gentlemen, I lay down the challenge to you that going forward, we have to change because unless we change, we are going to upset what is the fundamental life support system on Earth, our ocean. Thank you very much. You've already asked my question about whether we've got any benefit from lockdown. So that, the answer was a big fat no, that's a shame. Um, but just thinking about what the recoveries and et cetera, I mean, what do you think, how, how long would it take the sort of the biodiversity, et cetera, and, and uh, um, the fish docks and things to recover if we were to A, stop now, stop the pollution, or, or B, follow follow your recovery plans that you've tried to, to lay out? I assume that there's a big difference, but if we don't do anything, I assume there's a third one, which is it doesn't recover. Do we have any idea of, of time scales or anything? Or I, I was at a meeting um, last year where um, a couple of people stood up and said, we have eight to 10 years to get it right. And if we don't get it right in eight to 10 years, then there is a very, very strong possibility that we will go through a tipping point of some shape, form or other. The, the, the challenge is that the process um, is, is not linear and the environment will buffer, 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 and then it tends to fall over. And so um, various people have done sort of calculations, both in terms of you know, what the concentration of CO2 would be if we don't do, uh, undertake any mitigation actions. And they are saying that for the ocean, we have 10 years. Which is not long at all, really. No. No, frightening and, and, and short. There was, there was a meeting I was at uh, today uh, where um, they were quite categoric that actually part of the solution has to be some form of technology to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's, get, it's getting to that stage. We can't, we can't just stop using it. We've got you to You can't actually... just stop it because the um, lifetime of it, you know, if, if we stopped emitting today, then the concentration would not immediately start to diminish because carbon dioxide's half-life is about a hundred years mm. in the atmosphere. Now, the other thing is that although the, the bulk of the focus is on carbon dioxide, methane is also an issue. 
in that although the concentration of methane in the atmosphere is much less, it's a much more powerful um, greenhouse gas. It's about 20 times more powerful um, as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And one of the, the challenges is that we're already passing several points in the road. And what we're beginning to see is, for example, in the Arctic, the permafrost is beginning to warm up to a stage where actually it is emitting greenhouse gases. And so they are now contributing. So it's no longer just the human induced, the human, sorry, the direct human emissions. Nature has been taken to a stage where it now is giving up some of its trapped carbon dioxide and trapped methane. And that's now contributing as well. So until that, these areas, their temperatures themselves drop back, that will be again, part of the issue. So, so we've got sort of a double whammy in terms of the long half-life of, of CO2. Methane is a much shorter half-life, but also the fact that we now have, on top of the direct emissions, indirect emissions, which won't stop until we get these, the temperatures back down. Right, yes. Yeah, so it, again, again, it's yeah, that sort of cyclic sort of um, uh, effect there. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned near the start um, the effects of shipping. Um, yeah. And it was a bit worrying that you said five ships were half the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if you could sort of expand what what is it particularly that that shipping does in terms of pollution? Is is it the uh, is it the oils? Is it the emissions? Is it um, anti-fouling, which is it has been stopped, but there must be a lingering effect. Um, yeah, so the the greenhouse gas emissions, um, half greenhouse gas emissions government come from our five ships yes right <laughs> so the, the the burning of the fuel right yes okay um just hand over to to chris a couple of questions come in have there yeah there is um so i've got one coming through from um the from the reno branch account so i'm assuming this is rob harley um, he's saying uh, excellent presentation and uh, the wider seas policies and the to get it right within 10 years aspect of things could brexit hinder collaboration with our european neighbors i think that that um one of the things that we're doing is, is we're looking at the in, in 26 um, and um, you must think I spent it on. Um, I think this genuine um, attempt by uh, on on a global basis to um, make sure that a COP twenty six is 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 less, but also in terms of the global aspect. The other thing is that that. Um, in the Northeast Atlantic, uh, we have the OSPAR Commission, and the OSPAR Commission um, is comprised of many of the European countries that border uh, the North Sea, the Iberian Peninsula, uh, and therefore we would still be cooperating very, very closely uh, with, with them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a whole uh, flurry of questions through now, Colin. So, um, how much time do you have? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I've got another one here from from Ashley. He's asking, uh, what single change could someone make to their lifestyle to make the biggest positive change to the marine environment? I suspect that that um, the the type of transport that you use. Um, I, I suppose the biggest single difference is use less energy. So whether it be in your house, uh, whether it be um, in terms of transport, uh, whatever it is you do, uh, because ultimately, um, although even moving to a renewable energy basis, 
the bottom line is I think we have to um, be using less energy. Okay. Uh, another question from um, Rob Chaplin here. He says, uh, thanks for a fan fascinating and engaging presentation. He was wondering what you thought about the national scale implementation of reverse osmosis plants globally and its effect on ocean salinity. Malta, for example, relies on RO to supply it with fresh water. And the UK has a plant in Becton on, Becton on the Thames River. Are we at risk again of not understanding long-term impacts of technology? I'd have to say, I don't know very much about that technology at all. Um, but I think, you know, generally um, we have tended to implement processes and procedures um, and there have been unintended consequences from them. And so I think where we are going ahead with, 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 with newer technologies um, and, and you know, even in terms of renewable energy, um, I think we, we are becoming increasingly conscious that um, we must look at it um, not just in terms of um, what we're going to gain from that process, but actually how is it going to affect the environment? And what this actually means is that nowadays, um, a lot of my work involves um, natural science, social science and economics um, all brought together. And um, we're no longer um, siloized as we were. And so the blue economy, um, nature-based solutions and um, natural capital are I think words that we're going to become increasingly familiar with. Um, and as I say, when SMA 2020 is launched, great Christmas reading. Um, you can, you can uh, find out about, um, about all this good stuff. Brilliant. I'll look forward to reading it during my Christmas closure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got two more questions on the board. Um, One's from Dick. He's saying, uh, what about marine problems from our chemicals and pharmaceuticals? Um, are they not a serious cause of concern for marine life? Right. Um, I actually published a paper um, earlier this year on um, the presence of various pharmaceuticals in the Clyde and the Forth. And we are seeing um, concentrations of um, specific chemicals, uh, antidepressants, for example, um, in uh, marine waters. What we don't know is the impact that these are having on the uh, biology and, uh, and the animals and plants that live there. My worry actually is that because historic, some of the historic pollutants, the chlorinated biphenols, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers are still there. What we're actually doing is we're just making an increasing cocktail of chemicals. And that to me is one of the biggest worries. And of course now, whether it is pharmaceuticals or indeed some of the personal care products, um, you know, we, we've heard a lot about suntan creams, but also silver, uh, particles have been used in um, some uh, products to stop um, mold and sort of socks that you know you've been out playing rugby and you've just bunged them in your bag and you've left them there um, so they use some silver particles to, to try and stop them going moldy they then get washed and out into the marine environment together with fibers and microplastics and how much of a, a vector might these microplastics provide in that they're hydrophobic. Um, the, 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 um, many of the, the chemicals, uh, the PCBs, the PBDEs are also hydrophobic. So they, they um, adhere, they adsorb onto the microplastic. The microplastics are then ingested. And once they're in the tummy, you've got a very different situation. So do they then become bioavailable? So yes, it is, it is a concern 
We are doing work on it. Historically, as I say, we've looked at uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, polybrominate diphenyls, um, short chain chlorinated paraffins, but we are now looking at the um, pharmaceuticals, uh, a wide range of pharmaceuticals um, and personal care products. And the, the challenge is to actually develop a suitable toxicological um, test that says this water is um, got these contaminants in it and the effect, excuse me, on the biota is X or Y. And part of the challenge is that we go from you know, the babies up to the big adults. One of the challenges actually with some of the, the, the seals is that um, the, the, the fat in seals um, does contain quite a lot of contaminants. But when the, the mum lactates, the, the, the fat goes into the milk, carries the contaminants with them and the contaminants go to the pups. And so we're actually seeing contaminants coming from the environment into an animal being transferred to the pups. So there are lots of interlinks and interplay. So it's a very good question actually. And I could, I could give you a whole nother talk on, on, or, 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 on this because it is one of the impacts. But then if you take the fact that the temperatures are rising, so an animal's respiration rate will rise to compensate. So they're under stress because they're under uh, respiratory stress. They're under stress because they're exposed to contaminants. With a change in temperature, maybe a bit of change in salinity, we might get different pathogens, which may also cause additional stress. There is then this risk that the plants and animals, because they're not only subjected to um, this contaminant or this pathogen, they're con they, it is the cocktail to which they are subjected and that's what makes the situation so fuzzy because which of the pressures is actually going to result in um, for that individual animal an impact and will that then result in a population effect. Okay. Uh, the last question is from Professor Chengi Kuo. He says in one of your slides uh, you show eight pressures. Uh, what does this mean? Um, would it be better to call them threats or hazards so that we can estimate the risk levels and then seek ways of producing the risks of these threats? Yeah, um, that, that's a good question. What, we, what we've actually done, um, and I may sound a bit like a stuck record, but um, you can read about this in Scotland's main assessment while you're having your turkey. Um, <laughs> We've just gone through a bespoke process in Scotland where we got 45 academics in a room and we presented them with a problem, which was, these are the human activities. What pressures do these human activities result in? And which are the pressures that are having the greatest impact on the environment? And yeah, in, in some cases, the... If, if you like, especially in, in the chemical, for example, they are hazards. And in the case of um, invasive non-native species, they are hazards because they will potentially outcompete the natural species. In other cases, the process, the human process is resulting in, in some sort of change uh, to the environment. Um, so, we're developing ways of doing exactly as, as the, um, uh, the, the, the questioner put it, um, assessing what is the risk. Um, and so we sort of think, you know, is this going to uh, result in mortality or injury? Is it going to result in mortality such that it affects the whole population? Is it going to be localized or widespread? So, we, we've gone through a whole lot of parameters and, and, and come up with what we think is, a, is, is an assessment uh, for various geographic uh, areas. And um, again, you know, SMA 2020, uh, you'll, you'll get some of the answers there. Yeah, right. Um, we've got one last question through from um, Chris Boyd, um, who is our new... Uh, Rena Chief Executive Officer, um, he's asking, what advice would you like to 
uh, give to an aspiring naval architect or marine engineering professional with regards to making a difference? Um, well, several things, um, actually. Uh, first of all, run silently. Yep. Uh, secondly, um, no anti-foulants on the outside of the vessels, but we don't want them to become encrusted with anything. So how are you, <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do that. No, that's an <laughs> that's like an ultimate solution, I'm sure. There are people on here who just flinched when you said that. <laughs> how slippy can you make the sides so that nothing will stick to them? And the second thing is, uh, third thing, sorry, is a new way of powering um, vessels so that you're not using diesel as your primary fuel. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you very much. And um, I think that's everything, Ian. No, th thank you very much, Chris. No, th th thanks for everybody for, for the questions there. I, I think it just shows you how, how thought provoking it all is. And uh, I think we all know what we're doing for, for Christmas now. Um, I think at this point, I, I would just like to, to, to hand over to, to Andy, um, uh, uh, president of IES, just to, to give our the closing comments and our, our vote of thanks. Now, Andy. Thanks very much, Ian. It's Andy Pearson from the Institution of Engineers and Shipbuilders in Scotland. Now changed our name just to the Institution of Engineers in Scotland. It comes hard to me to remember to make that change, but there are actually several thank yous to give. The first one is to yourself, Ian White, Rob Harley, Chris McNair, and the whole Scottish Committee of RENA for hosting this event tonight. It really has been excellent, and thank you for that. And also to Chris Boyd for joining us. Um, it's good to see you taking an interest in what's happening here. So thank you all. Um, thank you to the audience, not only for attending, but also for an excellent question session, which I found really helpful in drilling down into some of these details. So that was also good. But of course, the main thanks uh, go to our, our excellent speaker tonight, Professor Colin Moffat. So Professor Moffat, thank you for several things. Firstly, um, I want to thank you for the title of your talk because it in itself was quite thought provoking. I was thinking about vast and essential. And you know, we all quite like to be thought of as essential, but I'm not so sure that we like to be thought of as vast. Maybe this is what lockdown has done to me. I've got a bit more of a conscience about it, but vast and essential absolutely summed up the essence of your talk, um, as your key messages on the screen have shown us, it really is essential. Um, but not only the size of the ocean, the, the one ocean that you mentioned, uh, obviously vast, but the size of your job and the size of the challenge facing us uh, also vast. So the title really was very, very appropriate. Um, there were a few other things that I wanted to pick up on that you mentioned. Um, firstly, that you did give us some extremely clear key messages at the end. So thank you for the clarity. It's such a big topic. It's very easy to get rabbit in the headlights kind of syndrome um, because there's so much to take on board. But you, you really have done a brilliant job of giving us the, the essence and enabling us to take that out to other people. Um, and that was your 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 main point of giving us the challenge that we have to change. So I think I can see on behalf of the audience, challenge accepted, but we still have to figure out what we have to do. And um, thank you for that challenge. It's really good that we can go and talk to our families and to our friends and our colleagues and our neighbors and explain to them these key messages in such a simple form. So in one sense, that's the way we can change. We need to be less shy about spreading this message because as you said, it really is absolutely critical. Um, and finally, I would really like to thank you for your enthusiasm for the subject, because that really shone through this evening. And it makes it so much um, easier, I would say, or more palatable or just more interesting listening to such a vast array of information. It could very easily have become a kind of um, a monolithic slab of information just beating us about the head and it was very very far from that it really was fascinating and was just an excellent exercise in how to do it so yeah. thank you for the title thank you for the key message thank you for the challenge and most of all thank you for your enthusiasm